During the second Iraq war, he served five active duty assignments, piloting military and non-military vessels at ports in Kuwait. Captain O'Connor holds a bachelor's degree from the Merchant Marine Academy and an MBA from the University of North Carolina. Um, so the history of the bar pilots on the St. Johns River is a history of hardy men um, meeting the demands of expediency of commerce in Jacksonville, um, getting ships in and out of the river. So what is a bar pilot? Next, please. The bar refers to the sandbar at the end of an estuary or river, often treacherous for navigation um, and shifting. The, the sands will shift, the channel changes, so constant updated knowledge is required in this kind of um, estuary. Um, next slide. I'll get to that. The, um, the St. John's River is 310 miles long. It starts south of here, flows north, turns right outside here in downtown Jacksonville, and heads east to meet the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the, over the course of that 310 miles, the river drops less than one inch per mile. So the tidal influence that we have on the river in Jacksonville um, with six feet of tide is 72 miles up the river, almost to Palatka. So a, a licensed um, pilot uh, gains his position after a long process of experience and knowledge, uh, and gaining knowledge through sea service, training, and um, thoroughly, thoroughly examined by the U.S. Coast Guard and um, the state of Florida. So our license is from the, uh, our federal license with the Coast Guard and a state license with the, uh, with the Department of Professional Regulation. Next slide. So a pilot climbs aboard um, each and every commercial ship and uh, military adjunct ships coming in and out of port um, with, loaded with the uh, local knowledge, um, local expert knowledge. The, um, upon getting up to the bridge, master passes the con to the pilot and the pilot guides the ship in and out of port um, through the confined waters, in confined waters. Next slide. Um, Pilots are, are uh, they're special, specialists in the local environmental conditions. Um, we use advanced knowledge of ship handling in confined waters for all types of ships. And what we're doing is, is using the forces under our control to overcome the effects of forces not under our control. Um, and as we go through the next five or six slides, you'll see all the various types of um, ships with any and all kinds coming in, including sail ships once in a while. But um, go ahead, next slide. Uh, there we have a, a couple of tankers meeting at Mayport. Next slide. Um, the El Yunque, sad to say the um, sister ship of the El Faro, SS El Faro, uh, combination multi-purpose ship. Next slide. Tug and barge units. Next slide. Uh, mega yachts, this one's laying at uh, BAE right now, the uh, Le Grand Bleu. Next, uh, cruise ships, well, our Carnival Elation coming in and out. I don't know if anyone took the opportunity to take a cruise on that one. Um, and next slide. There's a, a coal ship going up to uh, the terminal at Blonde Island. Next ship. And many car carriers um, in and out of this port. Uh, this port's the second largest um, by volume of vehicles, uh, or transporting vehicles in and out of uh, port. I think about s over 700,000. Um, but honestly, the larger vessels that we're seeing uh, now in Jacksonville, with no improvements to the waterway, it honestly makes uh, for a larger environmental risk um, in and out of port that we have to deal with. So um, today though, the St. John's Bar Pilot's an efficient um, operation that serves Jack's port facilities, the private terminals, the shipyards, 
U.S. government facilities along 45 miles of the St. Johns River as far as Green Cove Springs. And actually the Port of Jacksonville is now a, recognized as a combined port with the Port of Fernandina. Um, the 16 pilots in our organization service both of those ports. Um, I wa I've got a, let's see, next slide. What do we got? Yeah, a, a short video clip here um, of, uh, of day's work and yeah, right there on, okay. Anyway, this is our facility, this is our dock out at Mayport. Um, The jetties at Mayport. How long is the transit? For this job, um, going up to Blount Island um, with the docking, two and a half hours. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask me questions along the way, I'm easy. <laughs> But that facility is the container terminal at Blount Island, and next to it is the coal facility. So we're bringing this ship in, turning it, and docking at Portside 2. How do you charge your services by the size of the ship? The size yeah, it's a, a rate set by the state based on uh, draft and gross tonnage. And gross tonnage, as some of you may know, is it's a, a measure of internal volume and closed volume, 40 cubic feet per ton. Okay. What kind of language barriers have you experienced? Well, in, English is the internationally accepted language on the bridge of commercial ships, so it's spoken, uh, but, you know, sometimes hand signals work a little bit better. So, so I, looking back, Going back in time a little bit um, to understand how we got to this modern system in Jacksonville, um, in my view, there there were four eras of piloting in Jacksonville. Um, prior to 1900, the uh, there was a loose succession of pilots uh, at the end of the river. They, they operated largely independent of each other. Um, nepotism played a role. You had a lot of father-son um, combinations at the time. Um, that kind of thing still exists in some pilot organizations, but in Florida um, and in Jacksonville, I should say in Jacksonville, it more or less went away after the 1920s, and in Florida, it's no longer um, exists in any ports, due primarily to the fact that Florida regula the state regulates on the state level and uh, ac to access to a pilot's position requires a, 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 a quite a quite an in-depth test that the state gives. Anyway, so in the decade before 1900 and after in the decade after 1900 is what I call a transition period where we were going from that nepotistic period to um, what I call the Hawes Piper era. Um, in the Hawes Piper era for the pilots, were, the pilots were, um, typically were um, had come up to the school of hard knocks uh, at sea. Um, after 1973, the modern academy bred era came into being, and I'll talk more about each of these as I go along a little bit. Um, so going back in time, and this is kind of nice uh, following Kathy because there's a couple of notes here that uh, she, that uh, that supported what I have as well. But um, prior, before 500 years ago, the Timucua Indians were the ones that were, um, what I say, navigating on the river, and they surely were familiar with the treacherous aspects of the end of the river, the bar cut. Next slide. But after, after 1562, there's been a continuous settlement at the end of the river uh, around Mayport. Um, and started when Jean Rabot came into the came into the river 
And at that time, the bar was fairly treacherous. Only three of his ships were able to get across that bar and enter uh, the, the St. John's River, which he named Rio Mar, Mai, in French, uh, because having he came in on the 1st of May, May Day. Um, next slide. So much later, uh, moving ahead to 1829, only seven years after steamships had a steam vessel had been invented, um, Jacksonville saw the first uh, arrival of a, a steam schooner, coastwise schooners. Um, they they serviced into the St. Johns River from Savannah. It took them about 34 hours to make that trip down. Um, at the same time, these deeper draft uh, sail schooners that were on international voyages had a very difficult time coming into Jacksonville. Often they'd wait for several, several days for favorable conditions to get the vessel across the bar, or maybe not at all because of the draft. So um, the 1800s was, was characterized, I think, in J the international trade growth was characterized as very slow and due partly to this, the fact that they couldn't get these bigger ships in. So it would take a major civil engineering project, the St. John's, Jet Bar, the St. John's River jetties, to allow uh, more ocean-going vessels to enter and leave the port. Next slide. So the jetties were the uh, first and most consequential major change to the river. Um, the earliest published depths uh, on the river were 12 to 14 feet. And this is the channel from the 1850s quite different than what it looks like today. You know, you had to know where these bars are and actually the river in this portion it shifted north and south over the course of a, about a three-year period where the channel actually moved, um, the navigable channel moved. Um, so the limiting depths for the river and for commerce were out here at the bar, not, up, not further upriver. The river was, was deeper um, as you went along up, up the river. In fact, right outside here, there are spots that are 50 and, and 70 feet deep. Um, so the other, this map was from 1853, and about that same time, over the, through, the ninth, through the 1850s, there were um, a number of ships lost. There were at least five schooners and two steam vessels that were lost, um, grounded and sunk um, in, uh, on the bar out here. Um, next slide. So it wasn't, uh, this gentleman, Dr. Abel Seymour Baldwin, was actually the first medical doctor in Jacksonville. He had moved from the north um, to practice his, his uh, profession in the late 1830s, but in making his rounds on horseback out to, uh, in the vicinity of Mayport at the end of the river, he observed the river and, and how the bar shifted and uh, theorized that, well, we, we should be able to control that flow with a jetty. And so he was the first one to suggest a jetty system in the, eight, in the late 1840s. Uh, the conversation took place through the 1850s, um, and there was quite a bit of interest for that. Civil War came along, and uh, that more or less, that conversation was shelved until um, after the war, Dr. Baldwin again pushed and got the city fathers to uh, agree to do some further investigation. They invited a fellow named James Mead over. Um, James, James Ede, excuse me, had, um, he had designed and oversaw the construction of the Mississippi River, River jetties, uh, which increased commerce in, the, in and out of the Mississippi River tremendously. So um, why not here in Jacksonville? Um, Mr. Eads came over and suggested a two jetty system. Um, and construction, uh, it was appropriated, it was authorized and appropriated by Congress. The Corps of Engineers took up the project in, in uh, 1885. Next slide. Um, 
they were quite an engineering feat. I mean, they overcame quite a bit of uh, quite a number of obstacles, and the technology that was applied at the time for this construction was it was on the forefront. Um, interestingly, so. It took about 10 years to construct the jetties, but by 1895, the, the jetties were doing what they were designed to do. They were sweeping a channel and scouring out a channel at the, at, um, at the river's end. Next slide. Um, so it, within a matter of 10 years, they've estimated that more than four and a half million cubic yards of material was scoured out and created a, um, uh, a channel, a defined channel, um, easy enough to get, to get in and out of and deepening all the time. Um, it, 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 I think it was one of the major factors that caused Jacksonville to become an international shipping port. Um, Next slide. But at, at about the same time, to help control the flow and direct the flow of the river, there were a couple of other uh, training walls added. This one's at Mile Point, and then this one is around Shortcut. So that the river scoured the river channel, and there's the jetties out there, um, to the point that deepening projects were authorized the first one, 1916, the river was deepened to 30 feet, in 52 to 34, in 78 to 38 feet, and in 2003 to the current 40 feet that we're working with now. Next slide. We'll talk about, oh well, there's the jetties as we see it today, an aerial jetty, the north jetty, the south jetty, which is uh, right in the Mayport Naval Station. Naval base. And the river, course of the river, clear up to Blown Island. That's up to Blown Island, that's uh, about 11 miles. So, um, next slide. There were a series of lighthouses at the end of, in Mayport at the end of the river to assist uh, pilots and, and, and other navigators. The first, the Hazard Light, was built in 1829. It was built fairly close to the bank of the river and collapsed within a year. So um, a few years later in 1835, a second lighthouse was built. It was set back quite a ways from the bank. It was built to a height of 43 feet, which ended up not being high enough and it wasn't visible from, um, from sea coming in. Um, a third lighthouse was erected in 1858 to a height of 86 feet. That lighthouse still stands, and that lighthouse is actually on the Navy base, Mayport Naval Station property, just across the property line from um, Mayport, in the, in the town of Mayport. It's inaccessible to the public. Um, so after, after a number of years, 1929, next slide, uh, it was replaced, was extinguished, and was replaced with a lighthouse uh, out past the end of the river. This light, this a light ship, I should say. Excuse me. The light ship stayed lit for 30 years and was decommissioned by the Coast Guard in 1959, when a uh, another lighthouse was built on the Navy state on the naval base, uh, which continues to serve its purpose today. I want to turn to uh, the men, some of the men themselves. Next slide. So it was written in the, in the early 1800s that due to hardship and danger with a requisite measure of nerve and cool judgment and with a disregard for personal comfort or danger, they were men of great hardihood. It was true then and uh, we like to think it's true today. So um, next slide. In the early 1800s, there were many of the pilots' um, names were synonymous with the early settlers in, May, in Mayport. There were the Arnos, the Braddocks, the Christophers, the Houstons, the Deweys, and there were the Falanas, the Floyds, the Latimers, and the Lamies, to name a few. Um, 
1822, the first, uh, these pilots that were working at the end of the river were first recognized by the territorial government, uh, state government, and uh, designated as the St. John's Bar Branch. Like I said, they were, um, each was licensed individually by the state, but they did not necessarily associate with one another. Running down that list real quick, um, some notes. Captain James Arnault was one of the original 1822 pilots. He was the son of a Menorcan uh, sailor, seagoing sailor. They had emigrated to, to the area and um, he gravitated quickly to piloting. Uh, there were the Houstons and the Latimers and the Falanas. They were they lived across the river in what's called Pilot Town. Um, they the Houstons came from a were the pilots that were Houstons were um, descendants of the family that had moved from South Carolina down onto Talbot Island. Um, so they all had farms on Talbot Island, but in the fall and winter and spring they took up their other residents um, in uh, Pilot Town and continued their trade. Um, then there was uh, Knud Sorensen Bay. He emigrated from Norway in 1840 and immediately changed his name to John Johnson. So um, he took up the he took up the piloting profession and married into the Houston pilot family. So. Then there was uh, William Lamy. Lamy was born in 1812 in France. Um, he went to sea at the age of 12. He was sent to sea at the age of 12. But by 1836, he had showed up at the, uh, on a sail ship coming into Jacksonville. He liked it. He settled down. Um, and within two years, he had become a pilot and had married into the Arnaud family. He and his wife, Kate, had eight children. Next slide. Um, one of the older pictures that I could find, Captain Joseph King, he sa sailed into, okay, he sailed into Jacksonville, um, married Clara Arnault in 1881, um, his father, whose father had been a pilot and, gran and her grandfather was a pilot. Next slide. The bar pilots lived in Mayport, on this side and Pilot Town over on that side. Um, it was written that they lived in fine homes and, um, and, and comfortable surroundings, maybe due to the um, hardship of the job that they, that they encountered. So next slide. Today we, um, we attribute the, the origin of the St. John's Bar Pilots Association to this gentleman, Captain George, Washington Spaulding. Spaulding had grown up in, um, in, in Ohio on the banks of the uh, Lake Erie, come to Jacksonville, started fishing, quickly gravitated to piloting um, in the 18, late 1880s. About the time the jetties were being built, uh, he saw the need, he, he foresaw the need for um, a good service to get pilots back and forth from ships. Prior, Prior to that, they were using a, a, a mishmash of, of so, small sailing schooners um, to get back and forth to the, to the ships. So, next slide. He purchased the Meta. The Meta had been, a, it was a sail schooner that had been built for America's Cup race. He motorized it and um, offered it, offered an interest to all the other pilots uh, at the end of the river. They all bought in. They associated for business purposes um, to pay for the uh, maintenance and operation of the vessel. All right, next slide. So um, during that same period of time, this transition period, there were a couple of uh, very interesting, uh, 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 along with Captain George Washington Spalling, two other pilots that were of, of note, Napoleon Bonaparte Broward and um, Captain James Floyd. Broward owned the vessel on the left, the three friends, and Floyd was a pilot, uh, was a captain of the Dauntless on the right. Both of these vessels were used for gun running uh, to support the Cuban insurgency in the mid-1890s. They made, the three friends made about 
uh, eight runs down there before they were uh, seized by the revenue cutter service. The Dauntless made a number of uh, trips down there and that Captain Floyd eventually, uh, the Cuban govern government recognized him um, in 1940, they honored him um, for his service during that time. Next slide. Um, so there's Napoleon Bonaparte Broward. Of course, he went on to have quite a, a long political career, illustrious political career in Jacksonville as sheriff, mayor, city council, governor, and then eventually got elected to the Senate, uh, the U.S. Senate, but he died before he could take office. The three friends, unfortunately, was neglected and sank at the dock um, in downtown Jacksonville in the late, late uh, 1930s. Um, next slide. I like to say the next period uh, that we uh, encounter is the Hawes Piper area, era um, in the early and mid 20th century. So, um, you know, these, like I had said, these fellows were generally gone, had gone to sea as novice hands on merchant ships. Um, they rose up through ranks in the school of hard knocks. Two of them, two of them that um, eventually became pilots, Captain T.M. Brown and Captain James Randolph. Captain Randolph is still alive, um, 94. But anyway, Captain Brown um, grew up around ja in Jacksonville, knocked around downtown, um, got a position aboard a merchant ship in the early 30s and went to sea so that by the time World War II came around he had been he had been, uh, he'd already had his master's license and was sailing as captain. Um, uh, he, I, a comment from him, from his, di uh, his autobiography. He said, the way it works is your instinct and knowledge and a lot of luck, it all has to be taken as it comes. Every ship is different as to size, draft, and the way she handles. Different nationalities, different people, good and bad weather. That was true a hundred years before him, it was, it was true during his time, and it's still true. Um, Captain Randolph, on the other hand, went to sea. He was recruited as a warm body by the merchant marine recruiter at the age of 17 um, in Tennessee. He um, sailed during the war, learned the trade, continued sailing after the war, coastwise for uh, Waterman Steamship Company. Uh, gained pilotage endorsements in, in, in a number of ports, including Jacksonville. He got invited into the Jacksonville Pilots in, in 1951. Because at that time it was more if you knew a pile, some of the pilots that were working and you could coerce or, and you impressed them, they would invite you in. Um, so like I said, he piloted for, he, uh, he, well, he piloted until 1994. He retired at the age of 70. And on, on piloting Captain Randolph, he waxes wistfully. He says, I love the work. I love the challenge of it. I love being at home. I, it was the best of both worlds. I brought ships up the river in thick fog and docked them in fog. I can just see the next buoy. It was crazy. Crazy. Hell, I love the challenge of it. Um, next slide. Um, it's interesting to note that there had been local regulation throughout um, the 1800s and up until 1973. Um, with a, a local board of pilot commissioners. In 1973, next slide saw a, a huge change, a sea change. The Department of, Pe of Professional Regulation on the state level took over control of piloting. Um, and they still, and they, they still do the licensing, the testing, set rates, uh, set, uh, take care of the discipline amongst the pilots for, um, um, next slide. Um, so the last 40 years is uh, what I consider the modern academy bred era. Um, a shining example of that is Captain uh, Sure S. Michael Walker. He was a 1969 uh, Kings Point USMMA alumni graduate. He went to sea on tankers for a number of years. He came into Jacksonville, um, took the test, was appointed pilot by the state in 1984. 
he gained quite a reputation as a good pilot, um, uh, very focused and on task. Next slide. But on Easter Sunday, 1994, he went out to board a ship and bring it in, a tank ship. He got up the river as far as Mayport, was experiencing chest pains and realized he was in serious trouble. Um, he called into the dispatcher. The dispatcher sent another pilot his way. But until, he, until that pilot arrived, he stayed at the con, um, passing two very large outbound vessels. Um, and so literally his last breath when he was expiring, he passed the con to Captain Aldemeyer, who had just arrived on the ship. Um, today, the Merchant Marine Academy honors him and uh, mariners who uh, perform acts of heroism while discharging the duties of, the merchant marine, of a merchant marine officer. Next slide. Um, so, just a real quick word about boats and boatmen. This is at literally how they started in the, in the 1800s, going out to vessels, um, rowing whale boats, uh, and whoever could get out first um, was able to call that ship and that was theirs. I think it, calling was to, it, whoever could yell the loudest and the ship whoever first heard them. Next slide. Like I said, there were, had been a number of other ships. So this is the Meta. Captain Sam Singleton um, was the boatman on this vessel for uh, 37 years at, uh, at the turn of the century and a few years after. And there's Captain Sam right there. He was quite a, he had uh, quite a number of acts of heroism on his own while he was a boatman. Next slide. So in the 1930s, we had this type of boat. It was an old wooden boat, made about 10 knots. And only in 1931 did we become an, a 24-hour port. But um, next slide. <clears throat> we graduated to a, a, a faster, more powerful boat. You know, we've got uh, the boatmen that we have, they're, we're quite proud of them. Um, they're, they, we compensate them fairly well, uh, but they come from uh, fishing families and um, local Mayport fellows generally. And they stay a long time with us, 35 years or so. Next slide. That's a modern pilot boat. Uh, in today's, today's edition, it'd be about $2 million. Next slide. So some of the things we have to deal with, some of the um, uh, structures, we, um, the, Jacksonville is a city of bridges, seven bridges, and this bridge, Dames Point Bridge, is one that we have to negotiate regularly. Next slide. So there's a carnival uh, magic passing under. There's about four feet clearance there. It's pretty good, right, right there. That big gull wing. Next slide. <laughs> Um, we've worked with the Corps of Engineers um, with some of their projects, their, uh, the, including the, the deepening project that's, um, that's on the books now. This uh, was changed recently uh, to help the, the, um, this Chickapit Bay drain out and to help us negotiate this portion of the river with less cross current. Next slide. Uh, we did that over in Vicksburg with, on their simulators. They simulated the river and vessels that uh, we typically were um, navigating. Next slide. So that deepening project, part of that is, um, you know, it has to do with national defense. And this, um, out at Mayport, that channel is already maintained to 50 feet into Mayport. So it's, it's already been started, more or less. Next slide. Uh, this is real quick. This, this is the size of the vessels that we have in Jacksonville now. And this 40 feet is what's at issue. But when the you know, vessel goes, uh, makes a turn, it sweeps wide. This one we figure is sweeping 355 feet in width. So in these um, turns, there's not a whole lot of room for air. And so we consider this deepening project to be as much a widening project as a deepening project. And there are areas of the channel that are going to be widened. Next slide. So this is kind of an interesting series real quick. Um, that's that same vessel, the MOL Benefactor, coming in. I'm over on this one, the MOL Majestic. And uh, this is a meeting situation, typical. Yeah, next slide. Next slide. She's got about 10,000 TEU on her. Next slide. There you go. And the next slide. 
And this is the, um, the AIS rendition of that. That's him, that's me. Not a whole lot of room. Okay, so last thing I want to mention is uh, the fact that, um, like I said, we, our organization has evolved and um, we stay involved with community, with the community, um, different organizations, including the Maritime Exchange, the Harbor Safety Committee, the Propeller Club, Mayport Waterfront Partnership. We're also uh, members of the professional societies, um, the Florida Harbor Pilots Association, American Pilots Association, and the Inter International Maritime Pilots Association. More than 100 years ago, on um, March 25th, 1913, the Jacksonville Rotarians gathered aboard the Meta, the vessel that we saw, and um, were joined by Captain Montcalm Broward, Napoleon's brother. At that time, he spoke, he shared his thoughts, and he spoke of the high calling of the river pilot, the necessity for character and ability and the responsibility of the position, and of the bar pilot's relationship with the city of Jacksonville. To paraphrase uh, what Captain Brower had to say that day, we say that Northeast Florida and the St. John's Bar Pilots will forever be friends and we're happy to, to um, serve the port and the community. And I'm happy to take any questions.